And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the most metal game that does not have any metal, the dark fantasy <laughs> known as Asunder, and from and from the failed superheroes, the one and only Adam Lawson. How are you doing tonight, man? Hey, I am I'm amazing. This is so cool. I love that. Yes, it is the most metal without metal. I love that <laughs> expression. And I think that's right. It's a truly metal game mm -hmm. in regards to it sort of being the balls to the wall, energy, these fabulously sexy, strong, capable characters. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, they're doing it without iron, but plenty of metal. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, per I'm pretty sure some of the art could be could be used as a it could be used as an album cover for um for a few for a few bands I can think of. One of one of them be one of them being Rhapsody. Um Ah, you know, it's funny. I was just with um Ozzy Osbourne's son Jack uh, yesterday because mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm writing a, a TV show uh, for mm -hmm. Netflix and he runs the company. And um <clears throat> he he was talking, you know, cuz Black Sabbath is obviously Oh, Ozzy's great, great creation. Mm -hmm. And um, we're talking about Black Sabbath. And it just t and, and, and it took me back, you know, to how metal that was and what, you know, this and how heavy metal really, like its art and visual was really like pulled from the pages of Dungeons and Dragons, right? It's this beautiful fantasy art, mm -hmm. you know, on album covers and, um, and all kinds of their imagery, the way they would dress up. It was very cosplay, you know, with this elaborate costuming. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's funny because as I was sitting there, I was like, if the, I was thinking about that, I was like, man, that's what I missed. And I think was part of the, you know, my inspiration and the design look for Asunder was, you know, can it be a little more metal, right? Because yeah. I can't D and D. They, they own that market and, and they've done it well. And that look and modern aesthetic of D and D, I can't touch. But um, why don't I do my own thing that sort of calls to a much more metal era and it feels more visceral and. Um, so that was why, yeah. uh, from an art standpoint, we went that way. You'd you'd probably get a kick out of um out of out of a uh, band known as Balsagoth. Oh, uh, I don't know this band. Balsagoth is a symphonic black metal band that started out in the mid '80s, and they did they did um I think f I think five or six albums throughout throughout the years, and its for its frontman Byron Roberts. As each of the albums telling the telling these elaborate stories that feel like they feel like they were pulled more out of the more out of say weird tales or the works of Michael Moorcock than something more Tolkien esque. Um, ah, okay. Which is which is works for me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. They're all. It's also infamous for having some of the long for some of the longest song names of of anything. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what, what what were these stories like? So they were like a, a dark fantasy. So the songs are like a dark fantasy story. Is that kind of what it was? Series of stories. He basically made his own world. But oh, um, okay. For example, one one of the tracks on one of their fir one of their first albums, um, "A Black Moon Broods Over Lemuria," was into the silent chambers <laughs> of the Sephirian Throne, Valley of Silent Paths. <laughs> And the fact that you know that lyric, that's amazing. <laughs> that's not a lyric. That's the name that's the name of the song. I think the Oh, I, that's the same. Yeah. <laughs> I think what I, I think one of the another long example is and I quote, and lol when the Imperium marches against Kol Kothoth, then dark sorceries shall enshroud the citadel of the obsidian crown. Wow. <laughs> wow, this guy, okay. Yeah, this is that's metal, yeah. right? That's that's metal, mm -hmm. and um, and I think that that is, you know, something that I I really long for in role playing games because I think, you know, I was um, I when I I direct this show called Bell Singers for Magic the Gathering, I said it's it's just celebrities playing Magic the Gathering, and, and then Joe mentioned Yellow's been with me on it a couple times, and um, you know, he's so funny because he, that's what he longs for, and, you know, he's like, you know, I was a college athlete. 
you know, he's this hulking, masculine, you know, most handsome man in America guy. Mm-hmm. He's like, really, I just want to play D&D, but I want to play it metal. <laughs> I just want the metal version of it. Um, and so I, I think that there's a lot of folks who feel that, that that's kind of the fun of role-playing games, right? It's to take them sort of the, to the metal angle, if you will. Yeah. And now with that, with that in mind, we had, we had talked a bit before I went live about, about kind, of our, kind of our introductions. So you had mentioned that D&D was your introduction. Was it advanced first or um, second? Or was it one of the like three or four different versions of the original? No, so it was Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, not second edition. Advanced Dungeons and Dragons was the very first. Um, and then maybe like uh, one to two years later, we bought the second edition book. And we're like, oh, this is so much easier to have Thacko. Do you remember? To hit AC yeah. zero. Um, you remember? I, I remember. And I've seen, I've seen some people mock, Th- mock Thaco. And my, my approach was Thaco was a decent idea that was explained like shit. <laughs> I mean, it was poorly explained. I agree with you. Not a bad idea. It, from a play mechanic, it kind of worked kind of fine. Mm-hmm. And we had, we had fun with it. But I remember that being like that change. I remember that change. Like, oh, now we have Thacko. Oh, now it's different. All right, you yeah. call it Thaco. I, we call it Thacko. Potato, um, potato. Yeah, right? And so, so that was like the, the initial beginnings. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't, you know, then, but then probably two or three years later, maybe a little longer, maybe 14, 15, that's when I got introduced to White Wolf. Um, I don't know if the, the Vampire, the Masquerade, uh, Werewolf, uh, the Apocalypse, mm-hmm. Mage, yeah, the Awakening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm familiar with and, White Wolf. Yeah, and when the, I remember when those games hit, that was like the real awakening for me on how much I just, I love Dungeons and Dragons, and I, you know, the, the most part about it I love the most is like coming with the characters and creating the story setting, which is, you know, what I do now for a living. Uh, in many ways, I think, my greatest incubation for TV writing was D&D, but mm-hmm. um, it's when I hit the White Wolf games that I really, role-playing games came to life in a new way for me. Like, they sunk deeper into me, right? Because mm-hmm. the, those worlds and those settings um, and sort of the, the dark nature of them, it, it, it changed them for me. And I was like, oh, wow, they, role-playing games can be all kinds of things, right? Yeah. I think it was yeah. I think it was around that the... Th- I think it was around that time. I don't know when this particular change happened, and maybe, 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 bef- maybe um, late eight, maybe late eighties, or po- or possibly, um, possibly earlier than that. But it was through the popularity of White Wolf that you, and a few other games that you started to see a shift away from the more war gamey origins of role playing games. Yeah, which. Because let's because I'll be flat out honest. I have a hard time seeing anybody using grid combat for um, vampire. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. It, it, no, that's uh, and that, that it was kind of the antithesis of that, right? Those games were like let's be the opposite of minis, right? Mm-hmm. Opposite of Warhammer Forty K. Let's make this much more like character and drama based. Yeah, and, like it had more like a theater performance. I remember you know when Masquerade um, ultimately allowed for this. Um, ultimately talk about this live action role playing yeah um, mind's early eye on mind's eye theater thank you for that and when we were doing that i remember playing that mind's eye theater you know i was a theater kid uh, in high school as well um and i remember thinking wow this is so fun right it brought out the more the acting side of what of what role playing games could be um and now you know when i you know all the shows i've directed in that space and with critical role and and force gray and all these these things really the acting side of it is what makes it re- so much more fun um or at least so much more fun as an adult at least i felt and so it's like i think that really started to change the way role-playing games are seen and i think now you know more modern role-playing games um try to emphasize that even as well as like fifth edition i think does a better job um than ever before of like emphasizing that part of it um and i i, I love that right like there's a great a couple of great rpgs one is this one called dread um as a horror RPG, uh, yeah. when you're playing the game, you familiar with the game? Yes. Uh, where you play, pull the Jenga block, another one called mm-hmm. Misspent Youth. Yeah. Um, okay, you know, dude, you know all the games. And so I, de- I-, I love what those uh, have expanded on what uh, an RPG experience can be. Because um, sometimes it's tricky to get a group that stays together, like, and it's consistent. Um, hence, when we were making Asunder, 
uh, Rob Schwab, who um, who also worked on a design team for 50 and mm-hmm. you know so many role playing games, kind of oh, yeah. I, icon. He 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 designed a system for Asunder, <clears throat> uh, which is based on his game Shadow of the Demon Lord. Mm-hmm. And then Brian Engard and I adapted it uh, to our world. Uh, Brian Engard doing a, a great deal of the writing, and he he worked on this game called Fate Pro, which you probably know. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, uh, Rob and I were talking about it. It's like, it's like, Adam, you know, what I've come to realize is that people stop getting together, that most d d groups or gaming groups fall apart. And so with Asunder, it's why the characters only go to level 10 and they don't do experience points. The Keeper just invites you to come, go up to the next level. Um, is that it's intended where you can extend the play accordion-wise, you know, take your four sessions to go up a level, or you can go up a session, go up a level every session but allows you an opportunity to get to the top of what a character's capabilities can be and what I would consider a more realistic window of time. Um, Cause even my, I have a, a, a D and D group that I play in, you know, we've been in it mm-hmm. for a year and a half, but we play once a month and it's taken us one and a half years to get to level six. Yeah. Right. And so <clears throat> I, I, I feel like there's really um, something nice about a more truncated system that way. And, um, and what's cool is in our story, there's, you don't have a class and Asunder, it works in a path based system, mm-hmm. which your character's abilities grow out of the narrative versus out of just leveling up as a fighter or a rogue or a mage. Mm-hmm. You know, you might start out, you start out at level zero and then along the way, you're going to make three choices on these paths. And maybe the first choice you make as a novice path is you choose the uh, survivor path. And these people, they have tons of health. They can survive harsh, harsh conditions. And they actually get benefits when they're fighting somebody and that person hurts them. It starts to fatigue the person hitting them. So it's like they wear the other person out the more that person hits them. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and then you might make it then along the story, your character is a survivor, but then you guys come in connection with this secret society called the wooden legion. And there they have these big organic mech like suits. And they believe they have the answers to why the world of the thunder is dying. Um, and they have no allegiances and they're always about their mission and your character may join that group. And then you would choose a second path as a wooden legionnaire and you would gain new abilities that came about because of this story connection. Right. And then you would have new abilities and also to your first path that you chose, you know, the, the survivor, it's still slightly, it still has some development still in it too. Or, you know, maybe one of the people in your group gets addicted to demon blood, right? They use it a couple times in a pinch in a fight. Now they become a, ra- they, their path choice be- takes them to become a ravager, which are these people who can like get more juice out of this demon blood addiction and are kind of like berserker type characters. Um, but, but, but because there's dozens of these, you can, you know, the play, the seekers in our world and the keeper um, can build a bit of a, um, uh, a bit of a back and forth and shaping this character into assuming these paths versus just leveling up in the one choice of a class. And, uh, and they also kind of stack nicely, right? Like you could start as a survivor and then maybe you join the bone, Ar- bone army, or maybe you start as a marauder who's like a dirty fighter who just deals lots of damage, but it's kind of weak and it's a dirty fighter that throws stuff in people's eyes. And then you maybe make, a, you have a change of fate on the way and then you become a bone recruit at this, this fabulous army and you take a different pathway. Um, and, but you still have your shady ways that maybe come into play still. So I think it adds a lot of complexity in your character that the abilities aren't just arbitrary to the story. They grow out of the story. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can take your character to the end in a, or not to the end, but to its maximum capability in a shorter period of time. Yeah. Um, uh, and I and I really love that. And as Rob and I were talking about that, that that was one of the reasons why I was excited about his system um, initially. And then I licensed mm-hmm. it from him, and then we expanded it out. But yeah. um, but that's um, uh, but what, but because in Asunder, it's, you know, its core tenet, right, is that it's this uh, it's it's this verdant world that's been broken into these mini islands, mm-hmm. right? It was broken asunder hence why its name right yeah and um and all the metal was ripped out of it from the gods who created the world when they left to go fight this eons long war and if anybody knows rob schwab's other game they actually went to go fight 
the demon lord. And that's a cool little tie-in. But they've left, so the metal's been gone, and humans were the gods' last creation, and they have this thing called essence inside them. And as they spilled out to the different islands, the essence inside of them spilled out of them and allowed them to connect with different parts of the land. Like in New Gaia, they became plant weavers, and they could reshape the plants into symbiotic living weapons or mech-like suits or tools or complex devices. Um, or if they're in Picari, it spilled out and connected with the beasts of the land. And then as a result, they were able to take the shape of beasts or command beasts mm -hmm. and take on their aspects. Um, and in, you know, Sky City, it, 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 it bonded with these Blythe crystals that allow the, these floating islands to exist in the sky. And so as a result, they're able to manipulate gravity and all that, that comes with that as far as having sometimes huge hulking weapons that they can shrink the gravity of, right? So they can wield them easily and then giving it full gravity right at the moment of impact. Um, and then there's the people of the mainland um, who, whose essence actually was encased. One of the gods realized it was spilling out and encased it on a few in the mainland. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they're more resilient and they're actually able to interface with chaos, which is what the gods use to make things and there are some shards of it left in the earth and those who touch it can start to wield it but it's, it's too powerful for humans and using it destroys you and it's super addictive and it allows you to alter essentially the shape of matter and reality and you can push it but each time you push it it does more damage to you you take on this thing called discord mm -hmm. and when your discord equals your strength you can explode your arm could permanently become glass um you take real consequences. Yeah. Now, it's fun. It's um funny. It's funny that you bring up um, Schwab um, and Shadow of the Demon Lord, since when I um initially I did before I looked at the quick start, I was not aware of that um, association. Oh, and okay. I'm cu I'm curious. Was it was it a was it a case where um. When you when you um found out about Shadow of the Demon Lord, you dis you decided to try try and connect, or was it a case where Schwab approached you about you about the idea, or how how did you end up landing on using a, a modified version of his of the system for Shadow of the Demon Lord for Asunder? Yeah, so I had um I was working with Brian Engard initially to mm -hmm. create the game, and I hired him on, and I'd had a I had my own system I, that I'd crafted. And we started to get into the details of it. He's like, Adam, you know, I, I think this might be a mistake. The amount of playtesting and time bandwidth to, to build a new system that like really resonates and works um, might be a mistake. And I think, uh, what if we tried stacking on top of someone? And at the moment, I was like, nah, I really have this cool idea that, that allows this unique mechanic with pushing dice. And uh, I really like. And I said, well, just take a look at this Shadow of the Demon Lord. Um, and let me know what you think. I read that. And I went, that's what we should do instead. Um, and it, 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 it captured everything I wanted to, to create and the feeling and the way players and characters could interact in the world of Asunder. And it was so smartly done. And obviously Rob is brilliant. And it's mm -hmm. been really, really, really played. And as a result, I, I realized that was the smarter choice. So that's, that's how it worked out. And then, you know, Rob, you know, Brian connected me to Rob and, and that's been kind of my, my relationship with, with Rob. Um, and he and I have you know, talked throughout the creation process, which has taken several years. Um, but he is really, uh, really a great support. And I think, it's, but, that's, but that's how it came to be. Yeah. Now, when it, com when it comes to the, there's obviously a lot of, sim a lot of similar things that are, that are being, that are done with, are done with it. Um, one one of the things that I found interesting that it that is um, definitely deviating from the from the uh, system that Schwab has is how you're utilizing essence trees instead yep. instead of the um, yep. instead of the um, mad instead of the magic spheres that were in were yep. in his stuff that was part of the reason I find that interesting is the fact that. Both games are definitely on the end of um, low f on low fantasy, but I'd say that I'd say that Shadow of the Demon Lord is far it leans far more into the grim dark end of the spectrum, whereas you're aiming more for um, something that would that would not be out of the ordinary in an issue of 
um, Metal Herlant, aka Heavy Metal Magazine, or right. we- or um, Weird Tales. I.e., yeah. you're aiming. Mo- it's definitely a dark fantasy, but it's but would it be fair of me to say that you're aiming more for sword and sorcery more more than um, grim dark? Yeah, I would say that we probably land a little less grim dark than than shadows of the demon lord, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I think it's because also shadows of the demon lord triggers a lot of tropes, you know, such as Satanist and strong cult ties and other things in there that really help bring that mm-hmm. like grim feeling to it. Yeah. Whereas this world, because it's also too, it's verdant. Um, and a few other things about it. It, it, it. You're right. It lands up much more like heavy metal. It ends up in a dark fantasy because the world is dying. The dead have risen. You know, the fungi have infected them and they're coming for for the living. Um, it has its like foreboding, like the world is coming to an end. Things really matter. Mm-hmm. But it, you're right. It doesn't have, it's not as far as shadows. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the when it comes to the uh, path system, would it how similar would it be set up compared to the um, compared to the paths that you might see in shat in shadows? Because in shadows, even among those ten levels, the paths are are not um, are not segmented between each other. It's not a case of okay, you choose this path for a few levels, then you choose this path for a few levels. No, it it kind of has a rotating attitude. For the 10 levels, are you working on a similar setup with your path system, or is it working a little bit differently? No, that's correct. Essentially what happens is, is your origin and each of your three paths give you bonuses as you progress in levels, mm-hmm. right? And so each level it affects a different thing. Like level one, you're affected by your novice path. Number Level two, you get the bonuses from your origin. Level three, you get it from your expert path. Level four... You know, you go back, you get something from your novice path, right? Mm-hmm. They kind of bounce around. So each level you're getting bonuses, but from a different source, origin, novice, expert, or master path. Um, so it's, it's like that. It's the same rotation. And the path system is, I, is we preserve that pretty identically. Now, obviously, the path and the abilities and the, the, you know, the unique passive skill or essence that you can take are 100% different. Mm-hmm. Um, but the mechanic is is almost identical. Yeah. yeah. When and when it comes to when it comes to essence, and this is this is one of the other reasons that I that I made the that I make the um, sword and sor- sword and sorcery comparison to a degree, is the f- is the fact that essence is is um not and it's you and it's used with the essence trees, it could lean into the idea of everyone is a mage but it's not but it doesn't really because yeah, because a lot of the essence trees don't necessarily deal with magic i'd say the only ones that would be fair to say that the only ones that ostensibly deal with magic are the more chaotic ones really chaos is the only one that would deem as something you know um in like this world of the truly fantastical mm-hmm. but instead of it, it, it but it's very Unlike Dungeons and Dragons, you, you, you're never going to shoot a fireball. You're, you're never going to shoot a bolt of lightning. You're, you're never going to do Morton Canyon's howling laughter. None of that kind of stuff. Your spell is the, what chaos does is essentially it allows you to manipulate reality and matter. So you can cause somebody to cease to exist. You can alter somebody's material state so they go from you know flesh to glass. Um, you can alter time. Um, so it's much more based on that aspect of what you can alter is much more like time and matter versus like you produce a cool effect, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And so you can also use chaos to shape and make things, right? You could make a chaos sword, you could make a chaos spear, or you could shape it into something tangible, but it doesn't have the spell-like look um, of, of Dungeons and Dragons. And also too, essence trees are not, um, don't really, one is you don't, not all paths lead to connecting deeper to your essence tree. Um, there are lots of paths that are paths of skill and mm-hmm. they don't reconnect you to your essence tree in any way. Um, and your essence tree is, um, is less like a spell so much as is it's like, it's a deeper understanding of your, your inherent gift, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that that everybody has this divine gift that everyone has um 
And you can intermingle that, right? You could choose a path that takes you to, that enhances your essence, and then you could take a path that focuses on your skill. So it's, um, it's less magic and it's more people have supernatural or enhanced gifts, if you will. Yeah. And some, now, um, in the quick start, the, um, es the essence trees that were shown, they, t um, they tend to have two, they tend to have two routes within it. Is, is that, is that going to be par for the course with, with most of them? For example, um, the essence tree shown for Black Isle ha has two paths, either in battle meditation or body conditioning. Is right. that is that how most of the um, essence trees are go are going to work for one and yep, two? Two, um, how what's the highest level that they go to? Do they, do they go all the way up to ten? So they go up to level five. Is the, like the is the max of an essence power? That's where they peak out. Is at level five, mm -hmm. and essentially you can use an essence ability at your essence rank or below, um, and so that rank goes up fairly slowly, mm -hmm. and um, you have certain number of usage ages per day, and then you also have this thing called seeker points, which everyone has one to start the session, and when you make great role playing moments or when your fatal flaw is triggered and you act on it you get an essence point and you can use those to <clears throat> emulate an ability or to do an extra spell or feat and not spell um, an extra essence um, ability. And so, um, yes, so they, but they all divide into two ways, right? And what I liked about that is there <clears throat> is because, you know, if you're an insect leader, for example, these people can reshape insects into complex tools and armor and all kinds of cool things. And they're the hated, of New Gaia, right? They're mm -hmm. the creepiest of the characters who get blamed for all the problems. So they, um, <clears throat> uh, you can take on two, you know, you can, there's two aspects to those essence trees. One allows you to take on the shape of an insect and the other one lets you, allows you to shape other insects into things or to summon them. Um, <clears throat> and one thing I also like about um, these essence trees is there's Ability, there's, a, there's a, you know, abilities that have usages, and there's also talents which don't have uses, usages connected to them. And you can select one or the other when you're in an essence tree. So you might, um, um, for example, there is um, animal magnetism is on for the beast masters of Bakari. It's mm -hmm. the beast aspect talent. And you essentially get a plus one boon, which is you... In this game, a boon is when you roll one die 20 to, you know, to succeed on a challenge roll, set it at difficulty by the keeper or a standard one is 10. Then you would roll an additional one die six and add that number to your, to your 20 sided die roll. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, that gives you a, a, a boon anytime you're trying to seduce somebody or charm somebody or to, you know, socially challenge somebody in a way that involves your, you know, sexiness, right? Mm -hmm. Or your charisma and so as a result of that 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 trigger that goes all day long so you in a way you're you're using your essence and it's, it's affecting how you play without it necessarily requiring you to like i used an ability and i can only use it once today yeah right so i so there's a mix of talents and a, a powers if you will now given how given how the, given the prevalence of um of hacking, house ruling, and the like, um, where do where do you draw the line between what would what would qualify as a as a essence talent and what would qualify as a class feature, or rather path feature in this case? Sorry, right? So a no, no problem. So a path feature uh, usually has to do with a um, a trained skill or a, an ability that anyone can do regardless of their essence tree. Mm -hmm. So for example, if I'm a seafarer, I have my essence tree leads into um, uh, mutations and commanding of the sea, right? I can mutate my body, crux your limbs, or I can command the waters and sea serpents, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, but only somebody with that origin can gain that essence tree. No one else can get to them, right? Because it's a, it's a divine gift that only people of that origin have. So a path skill is something that any origin can take on, right? For example, if you were to choose to be a war marshal, 
Um, this is an expert path that lets you lead people in battle. You can enhance the performance and and add boons to your your allies and banes to your enemies as you're in, in a combat situation. And any origin could assume that path, right? Mm -hmm. Call that a path of skill. Whereas <clears throat> not anyone can assume a path that would enhance your seafarer essence trees, right? Mm -hmm. Only somebody of that origin. Uh, so I would say that that's uh, one of the big separating factors. And also, <clears throat> um, you know, some of the different paths um, um, have certain abilities that are point-based. For example, the, they have unique they have a unique skill. For example, the veteran path. Every time you deliver a certain, every time you attack and have a success, or every time somebody misses you in combat, <clears throat> there you start to gain these points that you can use on some of your abilities that let you perform incredible feats um, in, in combat, mm -hmm. which is unique just to that path, um, which is a path that anyone, any of the origins could take. Yeah. Now, within the, um, within the power descriptions section, there, were, there, was, um, one partic there was one particular thing just going into that just said description of the, of the effect that I that I wanted to ask about, and that was oh, sure. push, mutate, and reverse. Um, gotcha. What would the what would those meta tags tend to Im, tend to um, imply when it comes to powers? Gotcha. So generally speaking, push, reverse, and uh, mutate in general um, refer just to the chaos essence tree. Chaos is the most unique of all the essence trees. Mm -hmm. It it in, in chaos is. Uh, has a, sort of its own special rules of the game. So when I'm using a chaos power, right, and let's say I'm going to do that to shape a chaos beast, right, mm -hmm. turn chaos into a living something, I can, it, it, I have to take one point of damage or take on two discord <clears throat> uh, to use it, right? But I can push it. I can suck, I can channel more chaos in which I would take on two more discord, but I increase the effect, right? And I can push this as many times, I can keep pushing this up to three times, right? But I start to ramp up my discord, which doesn't go away. It's not like health. It doesn't heal at the end, you know, heal, you know, four points at the end of the day, you know, when you rest, it, it, it takes a week to lose a point, right? So mm -hmm. it, you, you're really going in. Um, and so as a result, um, I can I can push the, the value of an ability, but doing a lot more damage to myself. So then the reverse is that you could reverse the effect of something. If, you know, if something was to slow time, you could do the reverse of it and speed up time. And then, and then mutate is when you take something that is temporary. For example, let's say I use my chaos power to warp who you are, right? Mm -hmm. And you, your face becomes uh, made out of stone and it grows hair. You know, that's what I will it to do. Mm -hmm. But I push it three times and then it goes from a temporary change to a mutation and now that's how you are permanently um so that's those are those those tags are unique to chaos um and uh, chaos is also unique because it's the only essence power that when you use it there is an addictive quality about it and so you want to use more you want to push more and so you have to use your willpower to help prevent you from pushing it too far and killing yourself because it's addictive. Mm -hmm. And I'm get I'm guessing that um, it now one of the other one of the other tags I saw was attack roll twenty plus. Would that also be something that's seen more often in chaos powers? Uh, no, an attack roll twenty plus is that what that occurs is if I uh, I roll one die twenty to. Let's say I'm trying to hit you. Your defense is 15. I roll one die 20, right? Mm -hmm. But I also get a boon because I'm a marauder and I'm seizing the advantage or exploiting your weakness, I should say. And as a result, I roll a, a boon. I roll an extra one die six. So let's say I rolled an 18 on my challenge roll and then a six on my boon. I would have rolled a 24, right? I've gone beyond 20 in my success. And when that happens, it opens up the door to special outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. Or let's say I have a bane, I have the opposite. Let's say I'm trying to convince you not to throw me in jail for a murder 
that you think I committed that I didn't. <clears throat> and in this social challenge, I challenge your intelligence with mine to see if I can convince you. But you are way on to me and I stole money from you gambling last night. So you're not my friend. So I would have a bane in trying to persuade you. So let's say I roll a three, mm -hmm. which would have been a fail, but then I rolled a five on my bane. I would then subtract five from that three and I would get a negative two. I can actually have a negative. I can drop below uh, zero. And when that happens, the exact opposite outcome occurs in a social challenge. So instead of me convincing you not to lock me up in jail, you for sure lock me up in jail. So I, I can, and I always, I always like that kind of, that kind of setup because doing doing it writing writing it as say roll roll twenty plus instead instead of natural twenty means that there's more opportunities for it to actually happen instead of just a flat five percent. Right. Um, That's what I felt like too, and I also felt like you know that it doesn't make sense that in normal circumstances. The, I could roll, there's literally a 5% chance that everything goes 100% wrong. That's, that's just too, uh, too likely. And then there's a 5% that it's perfection, right? Instead, it's nice. Is, it's when the circumstances are not normal, which is how it is very much in real life, right? Climbing a regular wall with, you know, stone and mortar, you know, you don't necessarily have this dramatic slip, but covering it, but if it's covered with ice, now that feeds into the story a little better why you had such a disastrous outcome, right? Because mm -hmm. it had a, a bane associated. And what's fun about this bane and boon system is the keeper can manipulate those on the fly. So you run into a situation and it's torrential rain. Everybody's got a bane on every attack roll. You, you can't see anywhere, mm -hmm. right? Or it's a torrential rainstorm on a ship that's rocking you know, like a drunken sailor, everybody has two banes. And in the event of banes, when you have multiple banes, you don't add those together. You would roll two die six and choose the highest of those two to subtract um, from your, 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 your challenge roll, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it allows the keeper to, you know, dramatically affect the circumstances by the environment, right? Which I think is in a really simple easy to understand way for players uh, and they can execute it re instantly. So I think it's really fun. Amy Vorpal, who's our keeper on the show, uh, guy of judgment where they're playing a Sunder. Mm -hmm. um, she's amazing at being able to like use those in a way that like enhances the story. So when things go terribly right or things go terribly wrong, it, 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 it leads into better storytelling and it's apparent as to why it went terribly wrong. It's because, why did you swing to hit that guy with your axe and you rolled a negative three? Why did you go flying overboard? Well, because it was raining and the boat, you know, took a hard right and you went flying. Um, so th that's a, a nice, there's another nice mechanic we like to use a lot called, <clears throat> uh, it has to do with a countdown dice is what we call it. And to help the keeper, let me just step that back one second. That we use countdown dice to create pressure. Because the idea of the Thunder is in the Thunder campaign, you don't start, oh, you're at a bar talking to your friends. And then you get into a fight and then you talk to a baron and they send you to go guard a caravan. Mm -hmm. Asunder adventures begin in the middle of the problem. So an Asunder campaign would start with a, a mobster has a knife to your throat and he wants the two sapphires you owe him from the gambling game, la gambling game last week. Or you start chained up inside of a slave pin and you're there by mistake, right? Or you start at the scene of a murder. There's a woman on the second floor screaming, blaming you guys, and the militia is coming. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, the keeper might roll one die six and say, all right, guys, I rolled a three. If the time is a little looser, they might say, okay, you guys have three rounds worth of choices before the militia shows up. And every round that happens, they count down the dice. Or if it's really pressure, as a real pressure cooker, she says, you can take three actions, meaning between the whole group, only three actions can be taken before the bad guys show up, right? Or before, or before the gangster cuts your throat or whatever might be the case. And to create this sense of pressure, 
Because with Asunder, I wanted to build a reactive world. Instead of it being that you were just, you were making the story happen in front of you, the story was slamming into you at all angles and you were reacting to it and therefore shaping your experience and your character. Uh, which is kind of what's encouraged in character creation too is, is not that it's a, it's a little more encouraged that you roll the dice to randomly generate your character because these stats aren't random. They're all assigned by your origin. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to feel like you could randomly end up underpowered. You would never, that would never happen, but that like your background, your fatal flaw, you know, this, we have an interesting things table where you could have like a scar or an, a unique object from 10,000 years ago that you don't know its meaning. You have this list of things that help shape your character. We kind of encourage that it's nice to roll that randomly. Um, so that, that way you react to what's happening with the dice roll and that shapes your character. Um, now you can certainly say, hey, listen, I want to be a seafarer and I want to go this direction. Totally fine too. But we encourage being a bit more of a reactive player and creating a reactive setting uh, in the game. Mm -hmm. And... One of the, uh, one, now, um, when it came to... Uh, unfortunately, no, unfortunately, Mildred, I've got to run All right, here. So, um, Does you want to give one last question and one last outro? Yeah, um, just, a, just, as a, um, fi just as a final note. Um, now, I, now I, I know that it's doing, pr it's doing pretty well on the campaign. Now, after, it, after it's um, finished, what, what, what month frame would you be shooting for a release window? So uh, from a digital standpoint, uh, hopefully on a digital standpoint, we can have those delivered probably by, I have on there in March, um, mm -hmm. but we're in proofread. We're in the last final bits of proofreading right now on all of the, because the books are hundred percent done. And from a digital standpoint, um, all the layouts been done, all that work, how Mangle did it, the novel, the custom dice are all built in 3D, the minis, et cetera. So ideally we're going to be able to deliver digital goods, you know, end of February, 1st of March, everybody will get the PDF versions of, of the, of the, of the source books. Right. Um, and then July will be when we deliver the hard copies of everything. Um, just but unfortunately minis, the molding time and print time and the two months it takes to get back from China to the States, et cetera, um, puts us, puts us at July. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I will be I will be keeping a close eye on, on the matter. And in the interest of full disclosure, I will note that I backed at the um, forty for um, forty dollar level. Yay! <laughs> Thank you, Mildred. Uh, Thank you for joining the world. I, I appreciate it. I pl Grateful my pleasure. Yeah. Yep. But I know I I know you've got I know you've got somewhere to be, so I'm not going to keep you too too much. But with that said. I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time to come up to the temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Yes, and yes. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, thank you, Mojo. I appreciate you having me on. Yep. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gimming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>